Boston.com. Tonight on Greater Boston from the Boston Public Library, former Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court Justice Robert Cordy on his role in Ukraine's Judiciary Ethics Council and the anti-corruption work that's pushed forward despite Russia's brutal assault on the country. Plus, former Obama speechwriter Cody Keenan joins me on his new book, Grace, and why he thinks 10 days in June 2015 defined the Obama presidency. When Russia launched its all-out assault on Ukraine, it upended millions of lives, forced everyday people to flee their homes or stay and fight, essentially ending life as Ukrainians knew it. The invasion also made the effort to reform the country's court system that much harder. The Ethics Council of the Judiciary of Ukraine was created last June in an effort to turn around a long history of corruption within the judicial system including allegations of bribery, controlled by political bosses, and judges using their courts to carry out political orders. The council is tasked with approving candidates to be appointed to the country's High Council of Justice, which is charged with appointing, disciplining, and dismissing judges. It's made up of three Ukrainian and three international legal experts, and it was supposed to convene in Ukraine in February, but obviously the fighting forced them to make other plans. I'm joined now by one of the council's members, former Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court Justice, Robert Cordy. Justice Cordy, it's good to see you. Great to see you, Jim. How bad was the corruption in the judiciary in Ukraine uh, that merited this kind of uh, action? Well, um, I can't tell you in depth about the corruption, but I can tell you, can tell you that it was a real factor. Um, public trust had reached the lowest of levels. Um, and um, internationally, the EU and others recognized that it was a huge priority uh, for the country if the country wanted to, for example, be a candidate for the EU. They really needed to address uh, corruption and some of the other qualities of the Ukrainian judiciary. My understanding is not that, I mean, from what I've read about it, not only did it seem like a mob operation, my words, not yours, but there are a lot of reports that pro-Russian oligarchs attempted to undermine any attempt to fix the judiciary, uh, obviously to undermine uh, Ukraine's yeah. effort. It's statehood. That sounds about right, doesn't it? It sure does. And um, we were, uh, once uh, the international members were appointed, there was a, a bit of a campaign to uh, sl uh, slander us. Uh, and uh, that was really prompted, I think, by uh, the same forces you're talking about. So did Zelensky do this? President Zelensky appointed, I think it was last June, you and your colleagues were appointed. Was this because he legitimately cares about this? It was because it was a demand of the EU. What was the motivation in your estimation, Justice? Well, I think a little bit of both. Um, this is part of a, a larger reform movement that has been going on for the last five or six years, gaining momentum over the last couple of years, both addressed to the judiciary, which is critically important in all of this, and also uh, to corruption more broadly in the uh, business community. The establishment of the anti-corruption court in Ukraine, which occurred in the last two years, was a huge step in really creating a court to focus uh, on corruption within uh, within the country. And um, that was an important step. And then this is an important step to try to create a uh, more trusted judiciary from the highest levels down to the bottom. I, I hope you don't take this the wrong way. Why'd they pick you? I don't know. I, I was recommended. I was recommended by the State Department and uh, I believe the World Bank as well. Uh, in part, I think because I have worked with judiciaries around the world mm -hmm. for the last 21 years and have worked extensively in uh, Asia, Eastern Europe uh, and elsewhere. Um, uh, back when I was on the court, I hosted some delegations of Ukrainian judges. Mm who were in Boston to learn more about the American system. In 2015, I was invited to speak at a judicial uh, and legal reform conference in Kyiv, sponsored by the Bar Association of Ukraine on judicial independence, and then was invited back in 2016 to talk about um, transparency and the relationship between a free press and an independent judiciary. 
and got to know a lot more about the challenges. Trust me, the corruption challenges, the lack of independence, and the people struggling against that because there really were struggles against that to try to change that. Can you speak a little bit more precisely about what your mandate is? What are you charged with doing? Well, um, the High Council of Justice really runs the judiciary mm -hmm. in the Ukraine. As you mentioned, everything from the appointment of judges, the assignment of judges, disciplining dismissal, setting the standards. It's 21 people headed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And um, these are nominated by different entities with, within the country. Uh, 10 of the members are nominated by the Congress of Judges. Members are nominated by the president, by the legislature, by the Bar Association, by the Prosecutors Association. And this entity is critically important to both the running of it and the, um, and the ethics of it. Um, and so we were asked, uh, or we were charged with, I should say, doing two things. First of all, conducting a um, one-time evaluation of all of the currently sitting members to determine whether they were met the criteria of professional ethics and integrity, which I can talk about a little more. Um, and then to interview candidates who have been recommended for appointment to the vacancies. There were four vacancies at the time. This was in November of last year. We had 36 applicants. Um, so there were two things, both involved with really doing background investigations, deep background investigations into the professional ethics and integrity of these candidates. Um, we had a, a, a bit of a surprise when we announced we were gonna start uh, doing the background investigations of the actual sitting members. The How'd they take that? The How'd they like that? Uh, 12 of them resigned right away. Wait, in anticipation yeah. of being... Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, guilty as charged. Tw you might not say that, 12 but I would. 12, 12 resigned in February mm -hmm. when we uh, announced that we were about to commence uh, doing the background investigations of the sitting members. Um, that was... Well, that created a whole new dynamic, of course, because... Now you have a high council of justice that doesn't have a quorum, that cannot operate. Um, and we got another 50 applicants from the uh -huh. Congress of Judges to fill those vacancies. So now we have like 86 or 90 applicants are those, uh, that we are, had to work with. Are, those cor are the courts functioning in Ukraine as we speak or no? Well, they're functioning um, as best they can. Um, I mean, for example, there are two thousand judicial vacancies in the Ukraine. Out of how many thousand. seats? Out of seven. Out of seven thousand. Wow. But, so a lot of courts have, you know, very, have one judge that should have seven or eight judges. Um, and uh, so they are, they are struggling. Uh, they're working hard, most of them, struggling and uh, trying to come out of this, um, hopefully with more respect and uh, more resources. You know, when you say so people have to pass an ethical test, just as a hypothetical, if one of these candidates, I don't know, had uh, 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 had a case around insurrection, an attempt to overthrow the government before him, and his wife had supported the insurrection, would that person be qualified ethically to sit on this council? Well, the facts would, of course, depending on the facts, the fact that someone supports um, a particular cause, I don't think is, is sufficient. But if someone were involved in organizing the cause, um, that would certainly might create a conflict of interest that would require some form of disclosure and, and recusal. You know, Justice Cordy, I don't know if it's your uh, uh, responsibility, but it seems to me, and I have no expertise in these areas, these kinds of changes, while to people in this country may make a ton of sense, are not just institutional changes, but require a cultural change, a change in mindset. I mean, we thought every part of the world wanted democracy, but some people weren't used to democracy and weren't so crazy about it. Do you worry about that kind of thing, or is that the president's mission? You're just worried about the institutional issues? Well, we're worried about the institutional issues, but you're, you're right about culture. Culture is extremely important. Um, and I must say, I have been completely impressed 
with the quality of the people that I've been dealing with uh -huh. and the determination, uh, not only of the legal community, but the staff that we have uh, and the judges that we've been working with. Um, there is a huge commitment here. And um, in spite of the war, I mean, this is something that's so important to them and they're working on. Uh, there are, obviously, um, you want people to respect and trust the judiciary. And to do that, you have to demonstrate that they are worthy of respect and uh -huh. trust. And this is part of uh, our challenge. And, and so even, even though you had to cancel a visit, I think it was in February or something, it was scheduled, the work goes on of your group? This can, continues? Oh, oh, sure. Okay. Are you worried, First of all. Are you worried about being used? at all? I mean, considering the history around the judiciary in this country, you come pretty highly credentialed, as do your colleagues. I read about all of them. Do you worry at the end of the day that you get used by people in high places who really don't support what you're doing? Not at all. I mean, uh, there have been instances in my work overseas with different countries that being used is something you have to really think about. Here, not at all. Not at all. And, and I, I feel, I feel, well, this is such an important mission. We're all in it together. And um, it's, it's been intense. I mean, uh, we have a, a full-time staff. I have three, three assistants, young lawyers in Kiev, wow. uh, marshalling the information. We have civil society and particularly those organizations that have been involved in, in uh, fighting corruption totally supportive and providing tremendous information for us to use in our investigations. Uh -huh. The National uh, Anti-Corruption Bureau is providing us with reports. Um, it's really a very impressive effort. Before you go, uh, there's a film later tonight that I've gotten to see already on Frontline about human rights violations, war crimes that are just mm. immense in Ukraine. Will Ukraine's own courts address some of them or the, will that be the province of international tribunals when this nightmare is over? No, the U Ukrainian courts will address some of them and indeed have already begun to do so. Um, hopefully they will not be the only ones that are addressing those horrible acts. And hopefully there will be an international tribunal of some sort, but the answer is yes, the Ukrainian judiciary is absolutely going to be involved in um, litigating and overseeing the litigation of those, those matters. Justice Cording, it's great to see you. I hope you'll keep us surprised. And I hope you come back. Tell us about your progress. Will do. Thanks, Thanks. Jim. Very Be well. well. Thanks so much. Thanks. By the way, just after we said goodbye, Justice Court, he mentioned he gets up at three, two days a week to have those meetings with people in Kiev. Every president faces a series of challenges, tragedies, history-making moments during their time in office. But for President Obama, several of those came all at once in just a 10-day stretch in 2015. It started with a shocking act of hate when a white supremacist executed eight worshipers and their pastor in an historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina, and was followed by this powerful moment of forgiveness. You took something very precious away from me. I will never talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you. I forgive you and my family forgive you. But we would like you to take this opportunity to repent. Although my grandfather and the other victims died at the hands of hate, this is proof, everyone's plea for your soul is proof that they, they lived in love and their legacies will live in love. So hate won't win. How to describe that outpouring of humanity in the face of such hate. But at a memorial service in Charleston, just days later, President Obama tried. Amazing grace. Mm -hmm. Amazing <laughs> grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
Dakota Keenan was chief White House speechwriter for Barack Obama at that time. And when two huge Supreme Court decisions were handed down that week, all chronicled in his new book aptly entitled Grace, President Obama and 10 Days in the Battle for America. Cody, congratulations. Great to have you here. Thanks, Jim. Nice to be with you. You wrote that speech with Barack Obama for that incredible day, that eulogy to Pastor uh, uh, Pinckney. He didn't want to give it nor did you want him to give a speech. Why and why? We'd already written a dozen eulogies at that point after mass shootings, you know, Newtown, Tucson, a whole slew of them. And it was actually back in 2013 after he put his, his second term agenda on the line to try to do something about guns. And Republicans blocked a uh, background checks vote in the Senate where he said, I don't want to do this anymore. If we've decided as a country we're not going to do anything about this, then I don't want to be the one who goes out and gives a eulogy and gives people permission to move on because we shouldn't move on from these. And selfishly, I didn't want to write it either because we had just both, we looked at each other and said, we've run out of words. But it was that clip you just showed of the families and that act of grace and forgiving the killer that ultimately pushed us forward. That was that. How does one change, if it isn't something like that, those incredible acts of grace, how does one change the mind of a president when he's dug in? Did he really want to not do it or did he want to be convinced that he should do it? It's a good question because he would often he would often push us into convincing him to do something, even when he already knew the answer. Um, but it really was what those families did. You know, he, he knew he should. And he knew he'd said on, on the Monday of that week that he wanted to go down and hug those families after that. But he still wasn't convinced that speaking would be the right thing to do. But it was, again, what they did. He ultimately said, fine, you know, that's let's talk about race. Let's talk about the Confederate flag. Let's talk about gun violence. But wrap it all up in grace. You know, Cody, uh, uh, I think most of us have seen, I think it's Pete Souza's photographs of the edits, the hand edits by Barack Obama. But what he did to your near final draft, I don't know if you'd call that editing. You described it as lines through whole pages, the last two pages of that yeah. speech. Why? Yeah, well, he was always our chief speechwriter, not me. He, he could always take our drafts to a higher place. But... This was one of those speeches where we really needed him to be involved. And he's talked about this before, that he didn't give me much to go on. And I didn't give him something really worthy of the moment. And he just, he called me back into the White House at 11 p.m. the night before that eulogy. And like you said, he crossed out the back two pages and he'd rewritten them entirely in about three hours, using the lyrics of Amazing Grace as a structure for the speech, which was one of those things I kicked myself for not thinking of before mm -hmm. that. But he's a good boss you know he he could have just said you failed get out of here he could have excised me from the equation completely but he brought me in talked to me for about a half hour uh made me feel better about it and then sent me back to work on the speech for another few hours when barack obama would say to you a speech was well written what did that mean cody uh, it was always followed with the word but you know he'd <laughs> say this the speech is well written but we can do better and that was always the case with his biggest speeches you know and this week was packed full of them he also had to speak in the book about uh whether or not the supreme court would um, find a right to marriage equality in the constitution you know there was a real chance that the supreme court was going to tell millions of americans you don't get to get married um, they were also ruled on obamacare that week and there's a real chance they're going to tell millions of people working one two jobs that you don't get a right to health insurance so we were cooking up a lot of stuff that week one last thing, you were among a very small number of people who knew he was going to sing, or at least thought it was very likely he was going to sing, correct? He told us that morning on the helicopters, there were about five of us. We were on Marine One, and he said, you know, if it feels right, I might sing it. And I, I, I kind of failed in my responsibility to notify the rest of the staff back at the White House. I forgot to tell anybody. Um, so there were just about five of us who knew. Even the, even the White House staff at the arena had no idea. I remember what it feels like as a consumer of that to this moment. I'm sure everybody watching does as well. So as you mentioned, the same morning, right before he got on Marine One, he had comments to make after the Obergefell same-sex marriage decision came down for the Supreme Court. Here's a little bit of what uh, President Obama had to say. It is a consequence of the countless small acts of courage of millions of people across decades who stood up, who came out and stayed strong, and came to believe in themselves and who they were. And slowly made an entire country realize that love is love. 
What would you have said if the decision had gone in the other direction, Cody Keenan? Yeah, that was pretty dark. And we had to write that speech because you don't know which way the Supreme Court's going to rule and you don't want to keep the country waiting for hours. So we had some legal backups planned and, and there were still going to be states where it was legal. Um, but that's a tough thing. That's a tough thing to say to people, you know, that that your country has decided you're somehow a second class citizen. And what I was really dreading was we had a whole bunch of gay colleagues in the White House. And I was just dreading having to look yeah. them in the eye if the decision went the other way. But what's really interesting about that clip you just pulled out is that was all ad lib. That was the end of the speech. He just kept going. And I think he was genuinely moved by the fact that the country had come so far so fast on an issue like that. You know, uh, the, the rainbow lights, I assume, would have happened regardless. Is that right or no? It is, yeah. Actually, there was a, there was a debate in the White House that week. You know, what do oh, we do beautiful. if the Supreme Court says no? Uh, and a young man named Jeff Tiller on staff said that it's even more important to light it up and, and remind everybody that, that you have a place in this country. You know, Cody Keenan, uh, we learn in the prologue of your book, you also wrote the, the Selma speech on the 50th anniversary of the uh, march uh, from uh, Selma to Montgomery over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and the violence that ensued from the state cops uh, directed at the, uh, at the civil rights uh, marchers. So you were central to that. You were central to the speech, the eulogy for Pastor Pinckney. Uh, Race was the centerpiece of so much of what the president said. You're a white guy. How hard was that to convey the thoughts of the first black president in great part about race in this country when you're who you are? The hardest part was doing it justice. And fortunately, we had him, you know, again, especially in those moments, he was our chief speechwriter. And, you know, I begin the book with, with the writing of Selma as a prologue because that really set up the thesis for these 10 days and really for politics. It was President Obama who added the line uh, that politics is not just a clash of armies, but a clash of wills. Mm -hmm. And we're always engaged in a contest to determine the true meaning of America. I'll tell you, you know, it, it wasn't during these 10 days, but there's another moment in your book that I loved is I think you were, I'm not sure, I think you were writing a State of the Union speech, which I can't even imagine how somebody uh, deals with the endless things that have to be mentioned. But wasn't it during a State of the U Union draft you were doing where he asked you if you ever listened to Miles Davis? Was that when it was? Yeah, and I, I said the Union Dressel. A State of the Union address will often make you forget good speech writing because you're just <laughs> trying to cram everything in there. And <clears throat> he pulled me in about a week before the speech and said, listen, the entire speech is at the 10. And I need parts of it, you know, down at 8, 7, 6. So I want you to go home tonight and don't do any work. I want you to listen to Miles Davis. And I said, why? And he said, well, the thing about Miles Davis is it's the, the notes you don't play. It's the silences. It's the spaces between. So I need some of that in this speech. Make the speech emotional. Have some highs. Have some lows. Have some quiet moments because... They can say just as much as any other words. Uh, and that was pretty cool advice. Well, there were also some pauses in his ad-libbing you described a minute ago after the yeah. Obergefell decision. That That's for sure. Morning. You know, everything that President Obama was a speaker, I think we'd agree Donald Trump was not crude, crass, intolerant, inarticulate, uh, uh, bullying, and all those sort of things. But when you watch an audience in front of a very different kind of audience, in front of Donald Trump, He's remarkably effective as a speaker, too. Is there a common thread, even though there are very few in terms of their ideology? There's not. You know, <clears throat> President Trump always spoke directly to his base and nobody else. There was never any attempt to change people's minds, bring the country together, you know, show people what our obligations are as citizens. And anytime someone asks me, you know, in today's modern media environment, do a president's words actually still matter and make a difference? I say, yeah, just look at President Trump, because those words can actually unleash some pretty awful stuff um, and, and turn each other against one another and, and make, you know, threats of political violence a re very real thing. So, yeah, president's words matter. Well, let's talk about Barack Obama's matter, words and whether they matter. We remember the, the legendary line, elections have consequences. Did his speeches have consequences? I don't think they ever had negative consequences. You know, at our best is like with the Charleston eulogy. He always practiced a politics, what I call a politics of redemption. He gave people the chance to change their minds uh, without lecturing or scolding or, you know, badgering people about the sins of the past. He, he's especially in that Charleston eulogy, you know, by using the words, maybe we've been blind to, to the fact that racism still exists in so much of our society or the Confederate flag still causes so much pain in people. Maybe we see that now. And, and that could be a more effective way. I've heard some letters in the book, too, from people who wrote in after that speech saying it really did change your minds. And 
it's very difficult to change people's minds today, uh, but we still approached every speech as if we could. Is it, was it hard for Barack Obama, the person, to show that kind of, I don't know if you didn't use the word restraint, but I will, that kind of restraint in the face of such horror so many times in this country? Yeah, as a, as a president, you can't always let loose your base emotions. Um, you do have to be a little bit restrained, you know, just, not just because your words can move markets and armies, but they can actually push people away. And he was always very aware of that. And, you know, I, one of the most gratifying things I ever read was when the writer, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, who I respect and admire a lot, wrote after the administration that for eight years, President Obama walked on ice and never fell. <laughs> and I felt like that was like the first time I really exhaled after all eight years in the White House. You know, uh, you worked for Ted Kennedy. I know. I think you started as an intern, if I remember correctly, and, and obviously a speechwriter for Barack Obama. Fairly like-minded politicians, pretty similar world views. Could you do what you do for somebody whose worldview you didn't share? Could you do it effectively? Would you do it? You can. Uh, I don't think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, and I don't think I would. You know, we just don't really have that tradition here. It, it, with every White House, there's a big change over in speech writing. I know it, it, I know a speechwriter, number 10 Downing Street, who I think is on his seventh or eighth prime minister now. It's just different. <laughs> but he's, he's been there for like 15 years. Um, I just don't think it'd, it'd be as much fun. And I, I, I was very lucky to have two bosses who not just I agreed with on most of the issues, but, but who really taught me what politics was all about. Uh, and that started by working for Ted Kennedy here in Boston. Well, Cody Keenan, the book is terrific. Great insight into not just speech writing, but into uh, a president. And I really loved it. So thanks so much. And it's really good to meet you. Thank you, Jim. Privilege. The book again is Grace, President Obama, and 10 Days in the Battle for America. And tomorrow you can catch Cody at the Edward Kennedy Institute at 7, talking about his book with former Senator Mo Cowan. The event is free, but you should register for tickets at emkinstitute.org. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thank you for watching. And please don't forget Ukraine.